Thanks, Matt. No, no pressure at all after that little build-up. But um, so, look, I'm just going to go through the first decade of life where we're learning to see, and, and talk about some very, you know, normal type things. And hopefully, uh, it was billed also as an ask the expert. I'm hope I know we're running a bit behind time, but I'll try and get through the stuff I want to get through because I already sense from a couple of questions that's been asked uh, even before the lecture started that we want to uh, open it up. Uh, I, I'm hoping to finish this and answer all your questions. So uh, learning to see childhood visual development, uh, uh, where it uh, and how it impacts on it going wrong sometimes. So look, this is a really commonly question, asked question that I get. Doc, what, what can my newborn see? I spent a lot of time in neonatal intensive care units where for months uh, children born prematurely are being looked after very intensively and uh, it's a very common question. And I, many people assume that uh, because the child in the first few weeks of life where they're prem or not can't show us that they're seeing, seeing by doing things like smiling and all the things that older children do that perhaps they're not not seeing at all, but that's definitely not the case. Research shows that really from the first moment they open their eyes after they're born, it's all starting to happen. And, uh, but the main thing we've got to remember is that I chose this picture because, of course, this little punter here is doing what most little punters at this age do and sleeping for 20, 22, 23 hours a day. So that, that makes it all the more important that that time when they're wakeful in this early period, we've just got to assume that they're seeing. Um, they're not fixing and following and, you know, uh, moving around smiling uh, when they're first born. But uh, all the evidence shows that, you know, when we measure their brain waves, when the eyes are open of a newborn, that that child's seeing. What are they seeing? Well, the correct answer really is who knows. But... But the most important thing to a newborn uh, really is a round thing with two dots there, one there and a line there. A lot of evidence to show that facial recognition is happening big time very soon. So yeah, of course we want mums and dads to be having a light, bright environment, interesting environment, lots of mobiles and everything. But the human face is the thing that newborn is really locking onto really quickly. And of course, you know, all these developmental milestones, yep, um, kids, uh, when they're dreaming or something's happening in their nappy, they can give very big smiles. But what we're interested in as vision people is that smile of recognition, that smile that when you give them, the child, a smile, bang, they smile back in recognition of that, which is a sensational thing to, to see. So, um, and I'm often asked... Um, uh, how, how does uh, a visual impairment in a child affect uh, uh, other milestones? I mean, obviously, the visual milestones are going to be affected. A child who has very significant visual impairment is going to be slow to see or may not wind up smiling in recognition if their vision's profoundly bad. Um, it often has very little impact on a lot of other motor milestones. There's not a significant difference in how quickly, assuming the child is developmentally normal in other ways, not a significant difference in how quickly a child gets up on their feet and does all those sort of things. Um, you often see in neonatal intensive care units, children's wards, uh, lots of black and white. Uh, I'm often asked, look, does, um, uh, is the world of a, a child, uh, a very small infant, uh, a black and white world? Well, you know, there is some evidence to suggest that the colour part of our retinal development uh, uh, is happening a little bit more slowly, but, um, I, you know, I just feel a little bit funny about all those black and white pictures everywhere. The world around us is full of colour. It's a colourful world. I, I tend to discount that side of things, you know. The, we, we can't sort of um, make too much of that, and I don't make too much of that to, to parents. You know, we want a colourful world. We don't want completely black and uh, white world. Look, uh, the learning to see first six months of life particularly, children can do some pretty weird things with their eyes. You know, they're, they're asleep a lot, they're dreaming a lot, all those alarming movements that can happen to eyes uh, can be a source of concern to, uh, 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 to parents. So on the way to seeing, um, there can be a lot of things that can be quite alarming to parents. The alignment of the eyes, I mean... Um, 
many things that we call congenital are not congenital. Congenital esotropia, where the eyes go cross-eyed, is very rarely a you know, congenital condition when we go and see a whole bunch of babies just quietly sleeping, or any of us when we're quietly sleeping, we just gently prise the eyes open. The eyes can be sort of anywhere. And then visual fixation, that thing when they're awake, you know, that the motor part of uh, the muscle part of getting the eyes together, that's all happening in the first six months. But parents can sometimes be really quite alarmed by, by uh, eye movements and things not being right until... Uh, usually until about uh, six months of age. Um, and in this early period, we can get clues to visual impairment. Obviously, some parents who might have a, an inherited disease running in the family are hyper alert to stuff happening, uh, the visual milestones. You know, some parents are on your doorstep at six weeks because their child isn't smiling in recognition. Well, they might have been in the neonatal intensive care unit and not even be term yet. Um, all the milestones of a, uh, uh, d visual development are from term. If a child's born two or three months prematurely, I don't expect them to start doing that until six weeks post-term. And even then it might be delayed because they've been through so many other things that a premature baby can go through. Let's give this a go. Terrific. The six-month mark. I, I really do hang my hat on the six-month mark because all these sort of variable things should be sorted out by then. At six months, um, all other things being equal, we should have a child who's smiling, fixing on us, or fixing on an object of interest. I keep on saying us, but still, you know, that round thing with the two dots and everything is pretty important at six months. Following us around, smiling, do all those things. And the ocular alignment, the two eyes working in synchrony with each other. Um, I was just—I've always been interested that uh, the Down syndrome, common genetic condition uh, that that many of you may look after, Down syndrome kids on the website, um, uh, it says that uh, Down syndrome kids should be checked every six months. It doesn't say until when, but um, uh, what are we talking about at this six-month mark if things aren't right, uh, and just exactly how often should a um, a, a child be checked? I mean, just to stay on the Down syndrome, kids with known syndromes uh, where the eyes can be affected very severely uh, do need to be checked in the ne neonatal period. But then Down syndrome kids, once again, uh, when I go to the neonatal intensive care unit, I can't say anything about the, what the eyesight's going to be about any of the children because I'm relying on seeing them do something that tells me that they're seeing fixing and following, all that sort of stuff. So the six-month mark, you know, we should be able to sort out all that sort of thing about whether the parents think the child's seeing, whether I've got evidence that the child's showing me that it can see by following me around, doing all those sort of things. Um, so if we've got to that uh, uh, mark in the blue book, all kids in New South Wales, uh, have their parents have a blue book where it sort of documents all things that have got to be done in childhood, um, uh, early childhood centres usually do a check if it's not being done by a paediatrician or the GP at about uh, the six week mark and then the six month mark and then it's, it's pretty vague, the blue book's pretty vague after that so we have to sort of think about what the risk factors are for poor vision, family history of problems, uh, premature delivery, you are five times more likely if you're born weighing less than two and a half kilograms, which is not all that you know, small, but if you're weighing less than two and a half kilograms, you're five times, not 5%, 50%, five times more likely to be the child at five years down the track at school who needs glasses, needs to have had some eye patching, gone cross-eyed and have eyes straightened and all that sort of thing. Um, so we do need a system um, uh, to prevent our kids um, falling through the cracks because we know that... Um, if there's not something really obvious happening to our child, the child going really cross-eyed, well, something's wrong here, let's take the child to see the doctor. If they have very poor vision in one eye, you can pass most of your developmental milestones with one really good eye and one eye that isn't worth a cracker. So we've got that first six months covered. Um, we're sort of in a situation between six months and starting school where... Um, if there's something obviously like going cross-eyed happening, um, you'll get seen to, but uh, your little boy or girl might be running, jumping, doing well academically, starting to know their letters, 
doing little athletics and performing in every regard, but might be cold, stony, blind in one eye if, if the eyes, there's nothing external to see. For example, like being extremely far-sighted in one eye and being not far-sighted in the other, the two eyes are externally, uh, nothing to see. So how do we prevent these kids falling through the cracks? They were the good old days when I was a boy. Where in kindergarten, uh, there were school nurses that came around that checked the eyes and the ears of, of all children in, in their first year of school. Not bad, you can influence that. We're still in that first decade of life where we can influence things in a positive direction. Then there were bad old days, which is fairly recently, like um, between about 30 years ago and 10 years ago, kids slipped through the net. I would see eight, 10, 12 year olds who would come in who were champion tennis players, brilliant academically, did everything externally, just looked normal and were, uh, did not see the top letter on the chart in one eye just for want of a pair of glasses or whatever. And of course at 8, 10, 12 years of age, it's starting to be difficult to claw that vision back. Um, so um, about 10 years ago, a bit more than 10 years ago. Uh, -bum -bum -bum, sorry. Uh, the, the statewide eyesight preschooler screening program, I think that's what it stands for, STEPS. All children in New South Wales anyway. Is everyone from, anyone from outside New South Wales? We're all New South Welshmen and women, yeah, great. Um, in New South Wales, 10 years, it's a really tremendous service. All kids in preschool um, uh, get an eyesight test to pick up those kids uh, who externally look fine. I mean, children by and large don't complain of some of the things that we'd really complain about. Poor vision in one eye, um, double vision, stuff like that. The nature of the developmental system of a child is that they, they don't complain about those sort of things. So we need a fallback program and our current STEPS program is good. It's important to, uh, and it's conducted by uh, nurses specifically trained in um, uh, uh, doing a, a linear eyesight test. Uh, it is just eyesight. Um, the nurses might pick up other things but their job is to um, do monocular vision testing in each eye. It's a very tough test. It's a very tough test. You know, some four-year-olds just don't get the test. They have to see all of the 6-9 line, which is the night line you need to fly an aeroplane, um, in a linear fashion, um, like you're at the eye doctor, really. So it's quite a tough test. Um, and, and it generates quite a bit of work. These things used in statistical analyses of studies um, uh, False positives, because we're setting the bar pretty high for these kids, we get a lot of false positives. A lot of kids who, I don't know, a bit shy about doing it on the day, um, their, their maturation, you've got a sense that the vision system matures in the first decade of life, but everyone's maturation's a little bit different. Some, some kids just need an extra six, 12 months for their vision to mature to see that six, nine line, and if they get picked up a bit early, um, this generates false positives, which, which is no bad thing. It generates work for us because you've got to go and sort of examine these and do a gold standard test, put all the drops in, do the refraction, all that sort of business. But it's very good because it's, there's, uh, I've yet to come across in the last 10 years a false negative. In other words, a child who was said to be okay vision-wise by the nurses who, uh, who was not. I, I've yet to pick up one. And of course, uh, uh, some of the other talks you've heard were all sorts of unusual medical conditions. We do pick up a whole bunch of things that uh, sort of by accident, kids with cataracts, kids with iritis, kids with a vast uh, variety of medical conditions who, who because it was mainly affecting one eye and they, you know, kids have this huge capacity to just steam on and, and you know, they don't know there's anything wrong with their eyes. It's just how they've always been. They just steam on and do what they do. And, and you really have to be very, have very, very poor vision uh, as a child before it really becomes noticeable in terms of their behaviour. Right, so, you know, at step screening, we, uh, uh, we, we pick up a child who uh, has poor vision in one eye and, um, uh, you know, mums and dads Google, you know, lazy eye or, or you know, whatever this term that we use called amblyopia. And, and uh, I, there seems to be this feeling, I mean, we do it at four because it's a nice balance between 
the difficulty of measuring a child's vision. Why don't we do it at three or two? Well, we can, but it's getting pretty tough. You need some really expert people to measure the vision accurately of a three or a two-year-old. But at four, five, we've, we've got a good opportunity to get um, vision uh, back in terms of treatment and everything. So uh, this concept of amblyopia, uh, I suppose the way I look at it is that it's an eye that externally appears to be normal and healthy, but, but it's an eye that hasn't learnt to see for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and the way I put this to parents is that uh, learning to see in the first decade of life is a little bit of competition between these two eyes. And uh, for most of us, we get to the end of the first decade of life and it's a dead heat. Our vision's roughly the same in each eye. If for whatever reason, the vision, the image, the, the picture that the camera part of seeing is clearer, then that eye sometimes goes ahead and the computer part of seeing says, love that picture, we'll take all of that, we'll switch that camera off. It's not giving us any good information otherwise. So ultimately, despite the two eyes being healthy, because we're blurry here and it's a blurry image going back to the brain, perfectly healthy normal eye that doesn't even see the top letter on the chart. So um, there are different kinds of amblyopia. I mean, um, I suppose to re-emphasise the business about um, how we learn to see all those terrible experiments that were done uh, many years ago where they just um, stitched up kittens' eyes and, you know, um, then took their stitches off a month later or whatever and now they can see, but they can't see because in that critical period of the time they weren't doing what we were talking about before, opening their eyes, information going in. So if you deprive, I suppose a common way of, a common eye condition for us is um, John Grigg talked about how cataract in childhood is not all that uncommon. If you had a cataract in one eye, there is, there, there's, uh, there's, it's an important time critical event to get on and fix that because uh, if it's been there from birth, we normally like to operate it on in the second month of life. If it's somehow or other it sneaks through and even six months later, the vision that we can get back from that eye is, is actually very, very poor because that unaffected eye has just gone so far ahead. They're, they're, they're 90 yards ahead in a 100 metre race and no matter what we do to try and bring this eye up, uh, after the cataract removal, it's it's a difficult job. I suppose crooked eyes, um, eyes being esotropic or exotropic, um, is a common reason to have one eye uh, not working. I mean, if the visual axis, if one eye is looking and the other eye is not, uh, the brain does the same sort of thing. And usually that's an obvious thing that, that, that parents note and, and comes to attention uh, particularly if the eyes haven't straightened within the first six, first six months of life. Um, I suppose the common one and the one that's picked up most by the STEP screening program is simply an optical thing because... Um, and that's the one that's least obvious to outside observers. The two eyes look perfect, run, jump and everything, except um, uh, the child needs an incredibly strong lens to create a, uh, a clear image for this camera and uh, sees clearly without any lens for this eye. This eye just goes straight ahead in that, that, that race to see business and this one just gets left behind just for the want of uh, glasses often. And of course, um, I, I, uh, again, here this uh, amblyopia is, is, is terribly common. You know, three or four percent of kids have it. But, but it, of course it can occur on top of uh, the other um, medical conditions that we might all look after. And sometimes we sort of forget in, in um, retinal dystrophies, um, uh, tumours, uh, developmental abnormalities of the eye, that they can, part of the reason that the vision's poor can be just simply amblyopia on top of their developmental abnormality. Uh, and we need to treat that. It's, it's, uh, it's simple treatment by penalising the other eye. Glasses, who needs them? Well, it sort of depends, really. I, I think it's very important to say that refractive error or far-sighted, short-sightedness, uh, astigmatism, these things that we'll talk about, 
um, is a normal part of visual development. In some ways, we are growing into our eyes in the first uh, decade of life. 90% um, plus of the children uh, less than uh, preschool age children that come to see me are hypermetropic or far-sighted. That is the normal state of play. And if we give glasses to all of those, well, we'll be way over treating many of them. And I think importantly to say is that um, it actually will stop that growing into our eyes, which we, we give the term uh, emetropisation. In other words, the way our vision system, with the benefit of just opening our eyes and seeing, is, is perpetually being driven towards a normal situation over the first decade of life. And, and, and so paediatric ophthalmologists in particular are very cautious about giving uh, glasses where we, where we suspect that a child just needs another 6, 12, 18 months of their own visual maturation. Because if we give glasses too early in that situation, it just switches off the maturation that's, that's going to occur by itself. Um, myopia um, or short-sightedness um, uh, certainly comes school uh, age. Uh, it's very important to correct myopia um, uh, so that the child can see the smart board, tell the difference between the threes and the eights on the smart board. Often it's not necessary to correct that before starting school because uh, myopia in some ways is our friend in uh, small kids. Um, their world is close to them, their mother's close by, the th interesting things to them are all in their own hands, they don't have to see what the bus number coming is yet. Um, so correcting small amounts of myopia earlier in life uh, uh, until there's a real need to is, um, um, is sometimes uh, not, not critically important. Uh, astigmatism is this thing where the front window of the eye is a bit more curved in one meridian than it is in the other. And uh, everything has just got a little bit of uh, uh, a fuzz on it and uh, the, the, the person with astigmatism, no matter how hard they focus, can't get things quite clear. Um, often kids with headaches or kids just screen their eyes up all the time. We can correct our own astigmatism bit by, by screwing our eyes up. Um, again, it becomes critical at school age uh, in, in times uh, in, in those sort of situations. I mean, obviously, I mean, the obvious reason we give glasses is to, is to see clearly. And uh, 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 often the, the, the subjective responses of kids in school age uh, are, are straightforward and we sort of are in some ways treating how well they see the art eye chart just like we would treat an adult uh, population. But it, it becomes... Um, uh, more problematic when they're um, uh, preschool and are not reliable in, in what they're telling us in terms of their eyesight. Uh, another really important reason to give glasses is this example here. This child's um, dreadfully cross-eyed and his eyes straightened completely with glasses. So um, alignment of the eyes is, um, is a very significant reason for us um, to give glasses. I'm often asked um, with our visually impaired kids, say from retinal dystrophies, other sorts of things, oh, doc, you know, is there any point in me having glasses? Um, uh, I've got retinitis pigmentosa or whatever. Um, I, look, in general, we stick with the same rules that we apply to normally sighted kids. But um, there are many situations where if 90% of a young person's visual problem is due to something we can't do anything about currently, retinal dystrophy or something like that, can't do an operation or give a treatment, um, then that 10%, that if there's an optical problem that might help a bit, that magnifies how much improvement they might get out of that. So um, I suppose my threshold for giving glasses if there's a significant refractive error is lowered a bit for those kids. Um, but quite often they do come back and say, Doc, thanks for trying those glasses. I'll just, um, <laughs> I'll just do what I normally do, you know. But, but, uh, and, and I mean, the, the child's accommodative mechanism, that mechanism that allows uh, us to see the smallest thing in the Blue Mountains over out that window and then 
as a young person see the you know tiny things here I mean that's a big plus for kids they've got that powerful accommodative mechanism and uh, uh, looking at things uh, incredibly closely without doing any harm and, and glasses or magnifying devices often can't do any better than their own accommodative mechanism um, it's uh, it's an eye doctor a children's eye doctor um, the referral letter or parents come in saying, um, uh, my child's got a lazy eye, just always got to take a big deep breath and just sort out just exactly what, what everyone means about a lazy eye. It can mean so many different things. I mean, it can mean amblyopia, someone's measured their vision and, and, and the vision um, is poor in one eye for whatever reason. Um, it can mean um, uh, strabismus. The two visual, um, the two eyes not looking at the same thing simultaneously. Um, it can mean sort of um, abnormal movements of the eyes. Um, you may look after kids that have uh, uh, nystagmus um, early in life. I'll just digress a little bit on nystagmus. Uh, early in life, um, nystagmus can be uh, that, that dancing movement of the eyes can be. Um, uh, can be a sign of eyesight rather than poor vision. Many parents assume that the development of nystagmus, apart from being very alarming, is a sign that their child's blind. And, um, but the fast movements of nystagmus is one of those um, alternate ways of seeing. It does sometimes mean the vision's impaired, uh, but many, many people, James Galway, the well-known flute player, had nystagmus, he could drive a car, it doesn't imply that the vision's poor. Just in the same way that um, parents often think that a really bad strabismus that's really obvious means that the vision's really got to be very poor. The magnitude of those things are not correlated at all. Um, some uh, uh, people come in with lazy eye and what they're meaning is a droopy eyelid um, or a whole host of other things. They see something on their, their child's cornea, a uh, corneal opacity. So it is um, important to know what of these things that lay people use, meaning lazy term is, because apart from anything else, the timelines for managing uh, these things are different depending, uh, really depending on what uh, uh, the main impactful of these things in, is, which their impact on vision. I mean, um, for example, a, a ptosis usually doesn't get fixed until school age and all the other things that we've talked about, the mainstay of paediatric ophthalmology, glasses and eye patching, uh, penalising the stronger eye, come into play before doing those other things. Oh, sorry. Um, so look, this is my last slide so that we have got five or ten minutes, I hope, for questions. I mean, as, as the Safe Side Institute, other speakers have, have, have said, um, I mean, there, the future is bright. You know, there is no line in the sand aged eight. Um, if a 16-year-old uh, refugee from Sudan came in with amblyopia, I'd start patching them. And interestingly, we would get some improvement in vision. It's been well demonstrated now. Um, medical treatments. Uh, are improving um, all the time. You've heard about uh, uh, groundbreaking things that are being done here that uh, are going to lead to blind babies that I'm seeing now in neonatal intensive care units seeing in the future, in their lifetime. And of course the, 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 the thing, the technological help that's available to people who we can't currently help is just staggering. And it's not really super fancy stuff. It's, it's this thing that we've all got. Um, which is, is, is just staggering. I'm going to stop because um, I think I haven't answered the two questions. Um, uh, sh shall I ask? I'll answer these two questions. Someone said, how, how does uh, low vision uh, affect sleep and what can I do, take to get uh, help? Uh, really great question. Um, our circadian rhythm, that, that rhythm of uh, all our bodily functions, how alert and sparky we are, whether we want to go to sleep, um, our blood pressure, even our pressure in our eyes, has a 24-hour cycle. And that's guided by light coming into our eyes. It's entrained and we're sort of geared by light coming into our eyes. So the first part of that question is that you, you have to have very, very poor vision. You know, um, perception of light or very poor vision for 
that 24-hour cycle to get completely mucked up. And uh, I don't know if that person who asked that question, but my, um, my advice is uh, to seek the advice of a, um, a sleep physician because uh, there are good medications that can not just make it absolutely better, but things like melatonin particularly are relatively risk-free um, and, and are best dealt with by uh, a sleep physician. There's a great um, website called Sleep Lab, um, which is mainly for those teenagers who sleep patterns are just dreadful, but, but it's, a, it's a great um, resource. Um, uh, look, I'll open the floor to questions. Any, any questions? There was one other question, but I just thought if there's anyone from the floor that wanted to ask anything. Hello. Uh, you just mentioned um, holding things close and not doing any harm. Mm. What sort of harm would, could you do if you were holding something close? You can't. <laughs> you can't. I, I mean, young people do that to get the magnification. I mean, I can't do that without... So, you know, once you're 30, 40, um, it, it's a completely different kettle of fish. You do need magnification, whether it's a pair of these or whatever. So um, I, I, I encourage young people with visual impairments for whatever reason. Well, they just do it naturally themselves. They find that that sometimes the only way to get the magnification required to read whatever level of print is just to bring it close. And, and there's no evidence that doing that does any harm. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, that's a good point. I mean, you know, obviously if you're spending, that's your lifestyle, that's the way you see, um, you know, physios and OTs and that sort of thing uh, uh, can, can obviously help in that regard. But it's not going to hurt the eyes themselves. Sorry, can I get your Yeah, retinopathy of prematurity. Um, when, when you're born, say, at uh, uh, 24 weeks gestation, which, which, meant, which kids are born at, or any, any time prematurely, but it, it, people go blind um, uh, from retinopathy prematurity when they're weighing less than 1,000 grams, less than 26, 27 weeks. So the way I explain this is that um, uh, in utero, the fetus is relatively oxygen-deprived. Um, it's blue blood throwing, uh, going through, through it. So the retina is developing in a relatively oxygen-poor environment. The very first breath that a child at 24 weeks takes, even if there's no supplemental oxygen, is, room air is more than they were getting in utero. So it is an ischemic retinopathy, a lack of blood supply retinopathy because the retinal blood vessels think, oh, we're there, we don't have to develop anymore because a relatively high oxygen environment tells those blood vessels to switch off. But then the, the retina continues to develop. There is a metabolic demand. The retina starts crying out for oxygen. There's no blood vessels there. So blood vessels tend to then grow chaotically. Um, and uh, the retina that was good, I mean, a premature baby is seeing when they're, you know, it's not a congenital blindness. They go blind in the first few months of life or in former times they used to. So it's an ischemic retinopathy. The most common other ischemic retinopathy is the retinopathy that diabetics get. So it's a similar to untreated diabetic retinopathy, which is a blinding, in former times was blinding. Um, Stevie Wonder's blind because he was born prematurely. There are fewer children being born prematurely? No, no, babies are being born prematurely, left, right and centre. Well, the, 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 it's being, so why, why is it becoming less? If a baby is born this afternoon in Sydney prematurely, the most common reason they might be blind in six months is not retinopathy of prematurity, it's um, cerebral visual impairment. Uh, so why is that the case? Neonatal care is a lot better. We haven't fixed retinopathy of prematurity. Babies still go blind from it, but much that the treatment is a lot better. 
So in, in Sydney, the, the most common reason for a premature baby to be blind now is not retinopathy of prematurity, it's cortical visual impairment. Which has a more intellectual... Which, which often, of, often uh, cortical visual impairment has, is much more likely to be associated with other developmental problems that mean that the child's developmentally delayed, as opposed to those people that uh, we've met, and we all know Ron McCallum, the professor of law, he went blind from retinopathy of uh, prematurity, but quite clearly his brain was okay. So why do we know this baby didn't work so well? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a very tough question. And uh, at the pointy end, the neonatologists, I think, have very serious discussion. When someone goes into premature labour at 23, 24 weeks, I mean, it's obviously very alarming for everyone, but, but some very tough questions are asked about of the parents of what do you want us to do here? Because, and they're given the data. If you're born at 23 weeks gestation, two-thirds of those kids are going to have severe cerebral palsy. Severe cerebral palsy means that you are looked after, fed, all that sort of stuff toileted for the rest of your life. So, you know, yeah, that's a very tricky question. Mm. Yeah. What are your thoughts on behavioural optometrists? Yeah, um, I, good question. Um, look, I suppose there's uh, a lot of concern between uh, uh, paediatric ophthalmology and behavioural optometry. I, there have been large... Medic people tend to not do stuff unless there's a really good trial or study to show that a, a treatment works. Um, that's just what we've been drummed into us from the first day we entered medical school. Um, none of the things that are usually advocated by developmental optometry have been shown in a classic study, 100 people do the stuff people don't, there are no studies of that. So medical people tend to not. Um, I mean, life's busy. You know, you've got a four-year-old who didn't quite pass their step screening thing, parents looking lovingly at their little boy or girl and they've fallen behind a little bit in reading or whatever and, and we all want to help that child. Um, uh, but... Um, to do a whole bunch of exercises and other things for which there is no basis. You know, there's two other kids, they've got to go and do exercises for an hour three times a week and wear glasses and do a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, modern life for families is busy. I, I, I can't bring myself to recommend treatments that aren't of, 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 of uh, documented, provable benefit to families. And I think I speak for most of my paediatric medical colleagues in that. Just, sorry, just a question on progressive myopia. Yeah. Um, how common is it and what does the future look like? We've just had a, a student refer to us with progressive myopia um, and mum, when we spoke to her, said that she's been advised that her child is likely to go blind. Yeah. Um, so can you give me some yeah. idea as to uh, what the future holds? Yeah, no, no, a very, very important question there is an explosion worldwide of myopia. And uh, myopia of all levels is important to identify and uh, document uh, because uh, if, if there's an explosion in the population, then the group of people who are very myopic... I mean, mild myopia doesn't really affect you in your life at all. But someone who is minus 6, minus 16, yeah. minus 26, their, their lifetime risk of cataract, glaucoma, retinal problems of going blind uh, is much greater. So um, uh, what sort of treatments are proven? Um, there's a lot of work going in, uh, in, into this. The, um, uh, some simple things. All kids who are myopic or showing any tendency to that have to spend more time outside. Of course, we're perpetually being asked what the role of devices and all that sort of thing is. The evidence is that it is not so much the time spent on the device, it's the fact that we are all, this generation coming up now, is spending less time outdoors than their parents did, less time than I did, uh, less time than my parents did. We have to get 
those kids outside. And interestingly, they can play on their iPad outside. It is the sunlight coming in that is the important thing. So um, what, what other things can be done? Well, um, uh, uh, having kids in their correct correction, um, there, there's a lot of thing about, oh, we can't give the child a full correction. That, that, that'll make things worse. That's not true. Um, oh, we've got to give them bifocal so they're not focusing so much. That's not true. Um, it is the outdoors time and it is giving them the proper correction. And for some kids who are increasing more than one unit a, a day, there are some big studies to show that um, atropine drops, which, um, uh, I mean, we've known for 40 years that atropine helps in myopia. The only, the, the new thing is that what we knew 40 years ago was that atropine drops were just blur us completely, a completely useless treatment in Australia. You know, you've got to have bifocals and you, you've got two saucer shape, shaped pupils. It's just appalling treatment. What's new, the, what's been found out recently is that um, atropine 100 times weaker, so weak that you don't even, it doesn't blur your vision at all, is just as effective as, uh, as the old 1% atropine. So that's very important. I personally don't prescribe it unless the child is demonstrated to be increasing at one unit uh, uh, per year. And currently it's quite expensive treatment. She's on 0.1%. Yeah, yeah. And she's just started that therapy. Yeah. And it does, it, does, it does involve a commitment from the family, both cost-wise and to persist. You know, any of these treatments, glaucoma treatment for adults, whatever, persisting with treatment is always a problem. But it is relatively harmless treatment in the sense that uh, very few side effects. Once a day, just before they go to sleep, yeah, we all hate drops, but it's not a particularly stingy drop. And so, I, you know, I would certainly, any child that was progressing more than one unit a year, uh, we would have that discussion about that treatment and it's demonstrated to be effective. Huge studies have shown that. Mm. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's on the way, medication-wise. Do we just keep going or is the people coming? I'm going to be here. Uh, if, uh, perhaps if we have this question, if there are any others, I'm, I'm going to be around for a while. If there are. I'm just wondering about surgery for nystagmus. We've yes. had a couple of students who've had it. Yeah. Is it effective? Does it actually make a change in their visual acuity? Right. Um, the, the, the two usual reasons that we uh, uh, do treatment for um, nystagmus are to... Um, uh, uh, surgical treatment is, is just regular surgery like we would do for someone who's cross-eyed or whatever, uh, to uh, adjust a head posture. Um, uh, the, the, the debate's a little bit out on whether doing the, um, the, the standard sort of surgery helps vision. Uh, there are some very uh, strong proponents of this in the United States. Um, and I have one or two people who uh, come driving time. They're 6, 18 and they want to get across the line to drive. We have a lengthy discussion about doing this and I make no guarantees about it at all. But um, uh, to do it solely to get the vision um, uh, up a line, um, the jury's out on that. There, there are some, uh, you might also be aware that there are some extraordinary operations that people find about out about uh, online where all the four muscles that move our eyes in the horizontal direction are completely destroyed. Um, uh, and, and parents come in saying, I want that one, uh, you know, because it it's allegedly abolishes the nystagmus. I mean, classical nystagmus surgery does not abolish the nystagmus. Um, and I'm very cautious about, you know, that, that extraordinary operation that is uh, people in the States, I just don't know how they can bring themselves to do it. But um, so uh, there is a bit of Wild West out there um, and, and the internet does create those sort of problems uh, in terms of being able to find good websites, not uh, uh, bad websites. But, but many people would do that surgery. But I, I don't think any of my colleagues, we would say, we're going to do this operation and you will see another line. Mm. Because apart from anything in nystagmus, um, there's a huge variability in just measuring the vision. I mean, 
anyone that's looked after someone with stagmus knows that when they're a bit edgy, you know, their eyes start jiggling all over the place. Oh, we're going to do the eyesight test now, are we? Oh, I, you know, I mean, it's very, it's very tough. You know, the kids come in and they know they're on the spot. You know, it's just the eyesight test. Relax, relax. Oh, I'll try and relax, doctor. You know, great. I, I'm around if people wanted to ask other questions. <laughs>